Good morning. I'm glad you could join us today for the virtual dimension here at Living Springs Fellowship. Now, I'm going to be taking a break this week from our study through 2 Corinthians to, to bring you a, another prophecy update. I haven't done many of those in a while, so anyway, a prophecy update. Prophecy is really important. I've often referred to it as being spiritual intelligence, if you will. It's uh, probably the most insightful and most valuable intelligence that anyone can have because really through prophecy, God reveals to us the overarching spiritual dimension included and active in everything that is happening in the world, all of it toward his predetermined the fulfillment, or should I say, the culmination and fulfillment of his eternally predetermined redemptive plan for the ages. So it's important we can see what's going on, we can understand what it's all about, and we can once again kind of have a picture of where we are and where we're going in the terms of God's plan for the ages. So I know that many of you, like myself, are deeply troubled by what we're seeing unfolding before our eyes in Eastern Europe. And uh, maybe questioning so as to understand how it is that the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, always a cold, calculating, <laughs> a former KGB agent, uh, yet previously it seems a relatively somewhat rational leader on the world stage, although a lot of really bad things have been done to a lot of people all over the world as a result of his purposes, but now has suddenly broken forth in a hate-filled rage. People are actually questioning his mental stability, um, directing the full force of his formidable military might against his much smaller and innocent neighbors in a way that now clearly threatens the tenuous order and security that, you know, has held it Europe together since the end of World War II, over 70 years ago? Well, today God's word will reveal not only the real culprit <laughs> behind the terror ravaging Eastern Europe at the hands of Russia, but what all this holds for the future in terms of the ultimate culmination and fulfillment of God's eternally predetermined plan for the ages. In fact, you're going to see today in that greater overarching reality, I the unseen spirit realm, you're going to realize that in regards to the pieces of that plan, they're already in place and prepping for action. And with that, let me open with a quote from King David, who confounded by the evil and injustice that he saw in the world in his day, he penned this in Psalm chapter 73, verses 12 through 17. He said, Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. And he goes on, he says, Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain. I've washed my hands in innocence. So he has really tried to maintain his heart and integrity in the sight of God and, and, and to do what is right. And, to, and yet he's looking at all this stuff going on around him and even to him. And it's like, What? I mean, he said, for all day long, I've been plagued and chastened every morning. And, and I know. Every morning I wake up and I turn on the news and I see the images that are unfolding in Eastern Europe. I talk about messing up your day from the very beginning. I mean, it, it's horrible. It hurts to see what is happening to these people. And it does. It, every morning I wake up and I have this burden. Okay? So... You got to remember, David was the king of Israel. And so people would have been looking to him for answers to what it is they're seeing going on around them and all this crazy evil. Okay? And we are the same way, aren't we? We, we look towards men. We want men to give us the answers. We look to them to supply the solutions to the things we see. But you know, I like David's honesty because he, he says to the Lord, he says, you know, if, if I had said, I will speak thus. I, I'll go before the nation and I will give them, you know, I'll hold a news conference. We'll straighten all this out. So, you know, he says, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. I mean, 
in other words, not even he, the king, could have explained this to his people. He went on in verse 16, he said, when I thought to understand this, it was too painful for me. He said, until, until I went into the sanctuary of God, which tells you now who it was that he turned to for, like I said, spiritual intelligence. I mean, we're talking the real intelligence, the whole picture. Both what we see going on around us in the seen reality as well as that which is going on in the unseen reality of the spirit realm, okay? And he said, then I understood their end. So that is the value of prophecy, biblical prophecy. David said, then I understood their end. So the purpose really of this prophetic update today from the word of God is twofold, okay? To allow God's word to reveal the unseen realities behind what is going on, has been going on, and is going on today in Eastern Europe, and, and then how these events coinciding with biblical prophecy that have been revealed ahead of time by God here, I mean, between two and 3,000 years ago, all in testimony to the fact that in the end, God assures us his righteousness, his truth, and his purpose cannot be thwarted, but instead will prevail forever. Because for you and I who are in Jesus Christ, hey, our hope and destiny isn't tied or dependent upon either this present world or the circumstances we face therein. Rather, it's in that which God has called, saved, and sealed you and I out from among the world unto himself by his spirit who lives within us to one day and forever inherit in Jesus Christ as a direct result of what he alone has accomplished in our behalf through his miraculous incarnation, sinless life, selfless suffering, atoning death, and victorious resurrection. So with that, Let's find out what the Word of God reveals about all this in our Bibles today. So we will be looking at two sections, one in the New and one in the Old Testament, okay? First, we're going to look at Revelation chapter 20, and then we're going to get into Ezekiel, Ezekiel, should I say, chapters 38 and 39. So you want to find those places in your Bible so you can go there and you can read them with us, okay? So first, let's open up our Bibles to Revelation chapter 20 so as to really set this whole thing up, okay? Now, if you were with us during our two and a half year study through the book of Revelation that ended, <laughs> seems to me like recently, but really it was like over two years ago. Well, you're thorough, thoroughly familiar with the fact that following Christ's return to earth, his second coming, in his complete victory over the Antichrist and the armies of the nations that fought with him in the valley of Armageddon. This is what will follow as a result. Revelation chapter 20, look at verses 1 through 3. We read, this is another vision now, that the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of John to behold concerning some of the last events that are on the docket for the end of the age. We read, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations He's doing it today. He's been doing it ever since Adam and Eve, okay? That he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. So we're talking about Jesus is reigning in the earth. We'll get into that in just a little bit. But after these things, after the thousand years of Christ's reign, not that the reign is over with, but it's been a thousand years Jesus has been reigning we now read, it says, he must be released for a little while, okay? So, during that thousand-year period, we're told, this is what it's going to be like on the earth. This is, it's going to be great. 
We read in verses 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they did sit on them. This is after Satan has been locked up, basically, in the bottomless pit. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the worship of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, the fact that they judge doesn't mean it's, they're judging their souls in the sense of you're going to hell or this or that. They now, the saints, are reigning with Christ, and they are the ones who are judging righteousness in the earth. They're basically making sure, you know, everything is just as perfect as, it, as it's always been intended to be, as Christ now reigns on the earth. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead, those who died before this time and that's basically throughout the age of man's kingdom on earth, did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So the kingdom of Christ is the result, or those who reign with him have come forth in the first resurrection. We well, can't get in all that today, okay? But anyway, we're told, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him during that thousand-year period here. Okay. So, it is. It's what we refer to the millennial reign of Christ over all the earth. The peoples therein and all of their respective regions, nations. And the Bible reveals extensive details about this glorious time, especially in the Old Testament. There's a whole lot more actually in the Old Testament than is revealed in the book of Revelation about this time. So it is, it's a central theme of biblical prophecy, which really I think provides some insight into what the descendants of Israel were actually expecting and looking for at Jesus' first coming. They were looking for a conquering Messiah. They'd been living under Roman oppression. They'd been living under literally a thousand years, maybe 750 or more years of incredible, horrible, repressive Gentile oppression at the hands and under the feet of several great Gentile empires. And, you know, they still were. In fact, following Jesus' resurrection, his disciples asked him this in Acts 1.6. We read, it says, Therefore, when they had come together... They asked him, that being Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Yeah, all that glorious kingdom stuff, the Old Testament prophets foretold how when Messiah would rule the earth, Israel would then inherit all the land, all the land. Today they only really have control over a very small portion of it, but yeah, all the land that God had promised their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and dwell therein in complete peace and safety from all of the nations that for thousands of years had oppressed and held them captive. In fact, even including today, because though Israel exists in the land as a secular nation, it is still, under Gentile domination, it is still threatened with literally extermination at the hands of the enemies of the peoples who are all around them. And we know that that's going to really get, it's going to really get bad during the Great Tribulation and the reign of Antichrist, okay. So, yeah, with that in mind, you know, I'm thinking, why not? I mean, you think about the disciples. They're looking at Jesus now and they go, wow, he's just conquered death, hell and the grave. So, yeah, this must be the time. To which Jesus informed them in Acts 1, verses 7 and 8. He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And we know then that shortly after that, Jesus ascended to the Father in heaven and empowered his followers, his disciples, his witnesses, his church with the Holy Spirit. And so 
the church age began. And, and we're in that now. In fact, prophecy clearly indicates that we are nearing the end of the church age today as the world in every realm of its existence is and the fact that now the Jews are returning to the land really prepares to enter the final and distressful period of time known as the Great Tribulation leading up to Jesus' second coming. When he will then, after defeating Antichrist and locking Satan up in the abyss for a thousand years, he will establish his kingdom and reign over all the earth and all Israel. Right now, only some are in the land, but all Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, or Abraham through Isaac and Jacob that are everywhere in the earth will return and dwell safely, we're told in not just the part of the land, the little bit that they have now, but all the land that God promised Abraham around 5,000 years ago, at the end of which time, <laughs> look out. Look at verses 7 through 10 now. We're told here. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. And will go out and deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. We don't know how long that will take. Probably happened pretty fast, but it's not going to happen instantly, okay? And there's some players involved that are central to this, okay? Gog and Magog. To gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up. This is the vision John is seeing. They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. That would be New Jerusalem, which is now in the earth, in present day Israel. What happened? came to lay siege against the city and basically conquer and overthrow Christ. It says, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And now as far as the devil, <laughs> who deceived all of them into, into this, drew them into this campaign, we're told was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So you see, Satan will be released so as to deceive the nations and Gog and Magog, there they are, will lead the way. They will lead those nations into one final fatal culminating battle of the ages against the Lord. Well, what, what does that have to do with what we're seeing taking place in Eastern Europe today? Well, if you ask me, <laughs> this whole prophetic thing about Gog and Magog I'd say it's a wake-up call to you and I. And you'll see what I mean now. Let's go ahead and turn to Ezekiel chapter 38 in our Bibles today. Ezekiel chapter 38. It begins with verses 1 through 3. Listen. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So it's important for us to remember right now, that even now, God is against Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and, and Magog, okay, for that matter. And it, Sounds serious, and really it is. The thing is, is that over the centuries, there's been intense debate, shifting speculation regarding the who, what, and when of what is foretold and revealed in this particular passage of Scripture about the Russian invasion of Israel. Now, I, for example, stood upon the interpretations, the ideas, and the views regarding that passage that, that I'd heard and been taught I'd read and seen, explained and diagrammed by others only to see it all challenged and changed when I determined simply to work off just that which the Word of God says, nothing else. What does the Word of God say? And that's basically, I think, what we have to go on. And really, 
it's all that we need. It's the intelligence God has given us. As Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 makes clear, it says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. And this is important to remember that God has always, from everlasting to everlasting, has always known all things past, present, and future. It's nothing that is not known to God. It's all there. So the knowledge of God is infinite. And so far above us, even the very root of, the, the, even if you scratch the surface, so that, you know, David said at one point, he said, such knowledge is too high for me. He said, I cannot attain it. And neither can we. So just remember that, okay? There's a whole lot of stuff that God, we don't know. God doesn't reveal it to us. But we are told here in this verse, it says, but those things which are revealed, and here it is. This is God's exclusive testimony to mankind concerning his purpose and his purpose. But those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever. This is the most valuable thing that any of us have. But you see, that's the key. That's why we go to Scripture. We need to work off of just those things which are revealed. And you say, well, is there more that's coming? The Bible tells us that the fullness of God's revelation has been now fully revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. So we can't go beyond that. I mean, that's it. This is, this is what God, this is the fullness of God revealed to man in the person of Jesus Christ. And he's the center of all of it. So anyway, let's begin with what these first three verses say and, and reveal to us. Because really herein lies the real meat and relevance of our study today. Now notice the subject of this prophetic narrative is Gog. Not God, Gog. Gog of the land of Magog, who is the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. That's what the word of God reveals to us, okay? Now, the land of Magog. Magog, along with his brothers Meshech and Tubal, we find listed among the sons of Japheth. Japheth was the second son of Noah. Genesis chapter 10, verse 2, you see them there. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. So there you see them. Magog, Tubal, and Meshech. Who with their descendants migrated northward into a region here I, herein identified in scripture as the land of Magog. Now, the land of Magog occupies the regions of western Russia, north of the Caucasus region of Georgia, including far eastern Ukraine, about which Vladimir Putin fabricated lies concerning, yeah, the ethnic Russians who lived there for thousands of years as a justification for his current brutal invasion of Ukraine. And it extends on northward from the Black Sea up to present-day Moscow. Anyway, the land of Magog. In ancient times, the peoples of this region were known as the Scythians. They were a fierce and warlike people, which affords, I think, some of the insight to the, into the horrific violence and sheer brutality we see being inflicted upon the innocent people of Ukraine as a result of the Russian invasion of their own region and homeland, a different region other than that of the land of Magog. So it really is it's the invasion uh, outside of this <laughs> This, this region, okay, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, but it's playing out even now. I mean, before the eyes of a shocked and horrified world. So what is it that I'm talking about, okay? Let's talk about Gog, okay? Gog, Gog, yeah, man, you really, I really need to make sure I get that right. Gog, we're told, is a prince. The word is translated from a Hebrew word, nasi referring to a sheikh. A sheikh, well, a sheikh is a Middle Eastern term for a tribal leader who exerts power, authority, and influence among a particular region and its people. That's a prince. Hang on to that, okay? Which in this case, however, we're talking about a whole other area of the world now. We're talking about the land of Magog. 
the region of the earth wherein dwells the descendants of Magog as well as the descendants of his brothers, Meshech and Tubal. Now the land of Magog is something the Bible refers to as a principality, okay? Principality means a region that is ruled by a prince, Magog. Where this prince, this un... This prince has this, um, has, has his, a lot of influence. Good, bad, well, you're going to see. But you see, here's where the spiritual dimension of reality now comes into focus. Satan, for example, in Ephesians 2, verse 2, is described as or identified as being the prince of the power of the air. He's not a king. The Lord... Jesus Christ is the king. Okay. So the fact that he's a prince means that he's limited in scope and influence. But the power of the air is rather revealing because the power of the air refers to his particular realm of spiritual influence that is limited to the immediate heavens surrounding and enveloping all of the earth, its peoples, tribes, nations, and all their respective lands and regions. Which, you know, you've got to admit, from a merely human perspective, affords him rather vast and pervasive influence in the lives and the affairs of men and, and literally human history since the beginning. But always need to remember that that is only as God allows, according to his sovereign and eternally predetermined purpose and plan for the ages. Now, since Satan, a fallen angel, is a created being... He is neither all-present, all-knowing, or all-powerful as God alone is. I mean, face it, there's no way he can be everywhere at once. So, he has appointed other fallen angels or demon princes to affect the full scope of his evil purposes among the regions, peoples, tribes, and nations of the earth. Stirring up lawlessness hatred, oppression, violence, wars, affliction, suffering, not to mention all manner of lies and deception, lawlessness, anything to counter and oppose God and the truth of his purpose, design, and provision for mankind. And yet, he's actually the unwitting servant in all of this plan. He plays a part of it in the end and to his own demise. Anyway, it's these spiritual principalities that we as God's people, being citizens of his eternal kingdom and representatives of its king, Jesus Christ, these are what we need to engage and deal with. Because we have this spiritual intelligence, right? And deal with them in the unseen realm. As Ephesians 6.12 tells us, where it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, in other words, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, even against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Because face it, these unseen rulers of the darkness of this age, they are established and active in every region, or now we'll call them principalities, in the earth, including really right here in our own nation, in our own state, in our own region, okay, spreading their evil influence over broad areas and countless souls, typically from the seats of power, ideas, wealth, and influence. Like Gog has, uh, and is even doing today as the world is witnessing its terrible effects. Yeah, Gog is one of these demon princes. And the land of Magog is his region or principality. This is his region of appointed dominion of evil influence. And going into Ukraine, his influence has basically gone beyond his region. Which I think makes our opposition to what it is that he's doing, and the whole world is basically opposed to it, I think totally justified. So let's talk now about the peoples of this region the land of Magog, where this demonic prince exerts so much influence. Along with the descendants of Magog, there are also the descendants of his two brothers, Tubal, for instance. Tubal, 
his descendants are a people who've historically inhabited the region west of the upper Euphrates and the southern range of the Caucasus on the east of the Black Sea, including the, the Crimean Peninsula, which incidentally Russia under Putin took back by force back in 2014. Then there's Mish, Meshach. Meshach, his descendants are people widely known and regarded far and wide, even as far south as the land of Israel in the days of King David, as being a fierce and warlike people. If you don't believe me, well, get a load of what we hear about them in Psalm 120, verses 5 and 7. This is going back a ways. Woe is me that I dwell in Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Notice, he's been with one who hates peace. That's Gog, that spiritual prince. And as a result, he says, the writer says, I am for peace, but when I speak, they, that means those in that area who are under the, given themselves under the influence of this prince, says, they are for war. That's what Gog does and how he influences people who give themselves over to him. And now these people, the descendants of Meshech, they inhabited the Moschian Mountains between the Black and the Caspian Seas, earning them their ancient name, Moschi, the Moschi. And in fact, during the empires of the Babylonians and the Persians now, as these people mingled and formed an alliance with their relatives, the descendants of Tubal, way up there, Together they became known as, the Babylonians and the Persians gave them this name, they became known as the Moscovs, which became the initial identity of what has come to be known as the Russian nation. Now what about Rosh? <laughs> well actually, Rosh is neither a person or a people. It's a place. Rosh is the name given to the place where present day Moscow is today. Yeah, Moscow is the seat of power from which Gog exerts his influence, stirring up trouble and war among the descendants of Magog, Meshech, and Tubal. But only, and I repeat, this is important because we don't lay, we're not going to lay this on all the Russian people. That's not right. Only as those among them allow themselves to be so influenced. Which is basically how it is really with every region and tribe and people in the earth. And that includes you and I. Which you know is really why it's so critical that we, of all people, know and understand this stuff, okay? Because you know throughout history, Christians have allowed themselves to be influenced by these demonic principalities and as a result have said and done really hurtful things to others and have brought discredit upon the name of Christ, which is something that the powers of darkness really revel in seeing happen. They love that. I mean, just look at history. The Moscows, or Russia as we know it today, has a violent and a bloody history. And you really don't, even, even recently, you look at Ivan the Terrible, the Tsars, the Bolsheviks, Lenin, Stalin. We talk about the atrocities committed by Adolf Hitler. Stalin murdered far more people in his concentration camps and, and far more Jews even than Hitler did during his terrible reign. And now, well, look what we're dealing with. We're dealing with Vladimir Putin. And you know, the Russian military does reflect this. You see it under the command of Vladimir Putin and his generals who are clearly in being influenced by Gog, this unseen prince over the region, demonic prince, should I say, because you know, when it comes to things like rules of engagement, we hear about that a lot with our military. The Russian military today, 
um, rules of engagement don't mean anything to them. And those who've encountered them in battle can only describe their senseless disregard, their reckless, often sloppy strategies and execution as nothing short of savage, brutal, and ruthless. In fact, I just witnessed the other day on the news a Russian tank coming down a street in a Ukrainian city, motoring along, a little car with an elderly man in it was going the other way, and at the last moment, the tank turned and ran over the car, crushing the man without any reason. So, you know, now you have a pretty good idea as to why that is. It pretty much goes to the influence of that unseen demonic prince, Gog. Among this particular principality, we now know as the land of Magog. In fact, as I watched and listened to Vladimir Putin issue his hate-inspired diatribe against the innocent people of Ukraine as justification for the brutality he's now unleashed against them with some delusional twist on history that is not even accurate or true, it's one of the things that's causing world leaders to look at him and go, this guy's coming unhinged. I witnessed a man thoroughly in the grips of and under control of a powerful demon prince. And now, we all know who that is. In fact, Putin has openly threatened to use nuclear weapons against any nation that interferes with what he's purposed to do to the people of Ukraine. And, and he's also put his nuclear forces on high alert. Listen. This spiritual intelligence that we have here in the Word of God informs you and I as believers that this isn't Putin. It's Gog. I mean, it's eye-opening, utterly breathtaking, this otherwise hidden and humanly unknowable insight into the spiritual dimension behind the sheer brutality of warfare that's suddenly broken forth from this particular region or principality upon their neighbors, the innocent people of Ukraine, such humanly and noble spiritual insight and knowledge that I refer to as intelligence. Wow, the Word of God affords this stuff to all who truly love, study, and will live by it. As Jesus has called us to follow his example in word, as a, to be salt and light. The salt and light that withstands this evil and engages it in the spirit realm. So... What does this incredibly revealing information hold for the future? Well, we've already gotten the big picture from Revelation 20, okay? But we'll get a little more detail here in Ezekiel chapter 38. So let's look at verses 4 through 9. <clears throat> the Lord says through the prophet, I will turn you, speaking to Gog, the spirit prince. He says, I will turn you around Put hooks in your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And he's not alone, not just the Russians. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Tagarma from the far north with all its troops, many people are with you. So prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. When it says be a guard, it means that, that Gog is going to be their leader. The, he's the one who's going to bring and inspire the strategy that will be used with this great international force that has assembled as a result of Satan having gone out and deceived the nations. We're told in verse 8, it says, after many days, and I'm sure it refers to the thousand years Christ has been reigning over the earth, after many days, you will be visited. That word visited comes from a Hebrew word that means to be stirred. Okay, and we'll talk about that. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell safely. 
you will descend. I'm going to stop back on that thing safely. Again, it's important to realize that Israel's never dwelt safely in their land. Never. And they won't. Even through the, even now, and, and especially leading up to and into the Great Tribulation. Now, they're going to be literally fleeing from their lives into the regions of Moab to get away from the beast. So, this only happens during the reign of Christ. Verse 9, you will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. So you see, in the latter times, when is all of Israel will be dwelling safely in all of their land, because, yeah, Satan's been locked away in the abyss. He's the one who's really at the center of and the cause of all of the hatred against the Jewish people. Anyway, and Jesus is reigning over the earth in firm con and he's in complete control of every region or principality. Righteousness, truth, healing, and peace will prevail among all peoples, tribes, and nations. There won't be any evil. No lawlessness, no oppression, no war. The houses, the towns, and the cities of Israel, in stark contrast to today, won't even need any defenses. And every demonic prince in the earth will be effectively shut down and put on ice, so to speak, including Gog of the land of Magog. However, when God releases Satan back into the world for a short time to deceive the nations, you see what happens. As I said, the word of God says that Gog will be visited, essentially stirred or aroused once again by his boss, his boss, the prince of the power of the air, Satan. And now you think God's evil design on Eastern Europe is bad? This time an even more ambitious plan has hatched his, his mind. As God is, says, God says, I'm going to put hooks in your mouth. And I'm going to turn your sights, the sights of this demon prince in the north, from whatever it is he's looking at and has set his heart on going after, God turns it southward toward the seat of Christ's power and reign in the earth. Telling him, basically it's like, okay, Gog, this is it, man. The time has come. This is what you were put in this place to do. And it's what you've been doing for thousands of years, stirring up strife and war and hatred and violence and brutality. Well, hey, hey now's your big chance. I can see God now just saying, okay, Gog, come on, bring it on. Bring it on. And you know, I think Satan's going to be right there, right behind, the, right there with Gog. Telling him, yeah, go for it. I've deceived the nations. They'll totally put themselves under your command. So go on, lead the way. And so it's going to happen. Let's read it. Let's read the rest of this. As Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story, I guess. Okay. Prophecy continues to reveal regarding Gog. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty. Stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited, against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock who dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, Have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away the silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? As this great army suddenly arrives on the shores of the Mediterranean, and they're just standing on the sidelines going, whoa, what, you guys are going to do this? Verse 14, therefore, son of man, God speaking now to the prophet Ezekiel, he says, prophesy and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? It's like, safely meaning, he's going to see them. Their, their villages and their towns are, are undefended. 
Nobody, they've beaten their swords into pruning hooks and their, their, their weapons into plowshares and everybody's living in peace. And Yeah, it's like a thief walking down and seeing a jewelry store with no windows and no alarm system. It's like there it is for the taking. So verse 15, then you will come down from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the, here it is, the nations may know me when I am hollowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. In other words, Satan's gone out to see the nations. As a result of what happens now, the nations are going to know. God's going to reveal his wrath, his power before all of them. And it's going to happen at Gog's, Gog's expense, okay? 17, thus says the Lord God, are you of he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? That's divine intelligence. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. And as far as his army, Gog's army, the Lord says, every man's sword shall be against his brother. They're going to turn on each other in terror. And I will bring him to judgment. One day Gog will be brought to judgment. You watch what's happening in Europe today. I know it's easy to say, oh man. God, are you going to do something about this? One day, it'll happen. I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him and his troops and on the many peoples who are with him. Flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations. I'm Satan had Previously deceived, they will know the truth. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Verse chapter 39, And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog. And say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal again. And I'll turn you around, I'll lead you, bringing you up from the far north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Then I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. And you shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I'll give you to birds of prey of every sort and the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open field. I have spoken, says the Lord God. And I will, send, I will send fire on Magog and those who live in security in the coastlands. And they shall know that I am the Lord. And they shall know that I am the Lord. So in closing today, as you see these events unfolding around us, don't let your heart be troubled. This is our appointed time in God's plan for the ages. We're here for a reason. So Christians don't back down don't cower in fear. Don't freak out. Rather, engage the battle with the spiritual forces of darkness. How do we do that? Pray. Pray. And pray more. That the will of God be done. Even now, untold millions of Jesus' people, including many in Russia 
who are not under the influence of Gog are praying against the evil that we're watching play out against the people of Ukraine. This is a real-time spiritual warfare that we've been called to engage. So intercede in behalf of praying for and serving those who suffer in any way that you can as God provides but all the while remain steadfast in your faith, walking and thinking in the light of God's word, resisting the lies and the evil of these last days. Because there's a lot of deception. Believe me, the, prince of, the princes of the principalities, the rulers of the darkness of this world, are actively at work even where you are. And again, it's always... Do this with your heart and your eyes focused upward, loving, looking, and living for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. For as the final verses of Revelation, the very end of God's testimony to mankind, as we like to say, we know how it's all going to end. As the last verses of Revelation seal up the vision for the ages until the appointed time we read. And I close with this word to all of you. The Lord says, He who testifies to these things, that is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of prophecy. And the Spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, the Bible tells us. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Wherefore, let our response continually be, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Or as the first century Christians loved to say, Maranatha. And finally, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.